think as much about when and where that you're going to have big conversations than the what of what you're going to say. That might mean not springing a big discussion on your partner as you are brushing your teeth, getting ready for bed. You have to make sure you're both mentally in the right place to have the big conversation. I have a friend, Alex, who tweeted recently, the reason you're stressed is because you have decisions to make and you're not making them. How true do you think that is? It's so true. And by the way, not making a decision is in and of itself actually a decision. Uh, But decisions are stressful and no one teaches us how to make them properly. So uh, I absolutely agree with Alex. What do you think is wrong about conventional decision-making wisdom? Well, conventional wisdom teaches us that money and love are two separate things. And if you have to make a decision about your career, or if there are a lot of dollar signs involved, you should think about that with your head and analyze it, run some numbers, use a spreadsheet, but do not let emotion enter that decision. And on the other side, that love and relationships are decisions that are meant to be made with your heart and really um, not let your head mess with those decisions. And that's completely wrong because any big decision has a component of money and a component of love to it. And if you are ignoring one of those uh, big uh, realms, you are missing part of the picture. You're more likely to make a decision that you regret and you're going about it all wrong. How do you try to operationalize or formalize the use of the heart when it comes to decision making? That seems like a an ineffable impossibility that poets have been trying to describe for a very long time. How, how would you formalize something like that? Well, the key is um, to use something that helps you bring in both elements of the head and the heart or intuition, some people refer to it as, rather than the heart, your gut. Um, And one of the ways that we do this is to suggest a framework, a process to go through so that you're not uh, left to your own devices and kind of groping about um, trying to make the best decision you can, but really following a structured but flexible process so that it lets you access both the head and the heart in a way that kind of gives you a roadmap that you can rely on. That's the five C's that you come up with. Clarify, communicate, choices, check-in, and consequences. Clarify to me seems like, not only is it the first one, but most people when it comes to decisions, decision-making, having clarity around it. What is it that you're actually trying to decide? What is it that we're even looking at here? That seems to be a very big stumbling block. In your experience, which of the five C's or what are the other ones that are also large and how can people get more clarity around their decisions? Well, you're right that the first step is very important because it sets the stage for all the other steps. And if you don't have clarity on what you're seeking, what's important to you, uh, you're going to be hard pressed to get to a decision that you feel good about because you you don't know what you're seeking. Um, So that is a really important one. And it sounds simple, right? Just get clarify what's important to you. Uh, But the truth is that there are so many influences that cloud what we care about, right? You have family members, you might have friends, you might have um, a manager who is telling you what you should care about. And so the big part of being successful in that first step is untangling what you want from all of those other influences and just tuning in to what is important to you. Yes, there's one of my favorite blog posts of all time. It's written by a guy called Kyle Eschenroda. He wrote it back in 2017 now, and it's called What Do You Want to Want? And in it, he talks about the problem that our wants a lot of the time aren't ours. They are uh, societal norms. They are the way that we've dealt with past trauma. They are paths of least resistance. They are any one of a million things. And what he says is that you need to program more deeply than that. You need to get down to the source code of your desires and work out what you want to want. And uh, I've always loved using that as an insight because the things that you want aren't necessarily the things that you want to want. They just, they come from all over the place. So 
one one consideration when it comes to making decisions, planning for the future, so on and so forth, optionality and uncertainty, especially in the modern world, an unlimited number of different routes that we can go down. How do you account for the inevitable unknown unknowns of the future when it comes to making a decision with limited information right now? So I think that gets at our fifth C, which is consequences. And you're right, you can't know how everything is going to play out. But as humans, we have a bias, very strong bias to focus only on the short term. We see what's closest in front of us. And so what is important is to not just think of the short term, but try to play out your decision on the medium term and the longer term. So thinking about those different time horizons will help you realize that even if there is something you haven't anticipated, because there will absolutely be something that you don't anticipate, uh, that you have tricked your mind um, to overcome that short-term bias and start to see that sometimes things can be you know, lead to better dis- better outcomes in the longer term uh, if you just play them out. And I'll I'll give you an example, which is um, my older son switched schools this year. He's in fourth grade, and he did not want to leave the school that he had gone to from pre-K. And we were trying to explain to him that yes, even though this year is going to be uncomfortable, you're meeting new people. It's a new environment. Uh, there is uh, new things to get used to you actually will be able to go up to eighth grade in this school. So you won't have to change next year. You'll have a longer time to be with your friends. And, you know, it's hard to get a nine-year-old to do a lot of things, let alone see many years into the future. But that's an example of how we all think, right? We all just think of, I want to avoid the discomfort of doing something in the short run, but it actually might lead to more comfort in the long run. Given that a lot of people have concerns around the consequences of their decisions, and as we said at the the very start, one of the reasons that you might be stressed is because you have decisions to make and you're not making them, I imagine that people can become so mired in considering the consequences that it actually encourages them or discourages them from making decisions. It encourages this sort of uh, nihilism, apathy, fear, anxiety around the future. How do you suggest that someone work out the consequences without getting too stuck? Well, I am someone who is prone to analysis paralysis. So I I understand that. The lady that wrote the book about decision making, surely not. (laughs) <laughs> but, but I've learned how to overcome that. And part of it is to force myself to go through this process, right? So where I might want to uh, linger in thinking about something from all different angles and to um, kind of play it out on you know micro time horizons, I, I realize that that's actually not going to get me closer to a better outcome. That sometimes you do need to decide, and um, by going through the process, you give yourself more confidence that you have turned over the right rocks, that you have um, consulted the right people, that you have uh, importantly communicated with the others who are going to be affected by the decision. And then uh, my co-author has this phrase, which she got from her father, which is, uh, you've done your best. Angels couldn't do better. And so there is some uh, confidence, and we've heard from readers of the book, that they do feel more confident making the decisions, knowing that they have gone through this process, that they've approached it the best that they could, and that even if they're, the outcome goes sideways, like it sometimes does, uh, they couldn't have anticipated that, and they couldn't have done better. I think the consideration or the feeling that you could have, would have, should have foreseen whatever it was that was going to happen, probably not only in the moment, looking back, uh, causes people to have regret, but right now also makes people concerned because you can almost um, project forward the future regret if you make a bad decision. You think, oh God, I don't want to have to deal with the fact that I should have got that job instead of this job. And you go, well, as we said at the start, I had uh, Peterson on the show a few years ago, and he said, uh, you have to consider the price that you pay for inaction because people presume that inaction has no cost. And it's like, no, 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 no. Inaction is also a choice. Choosing not to do, you don't have the choice to not do something. Everything that you do, even not doing something, is doing something. So we've got uh, clarification. We understand why that's important and consequences. So we've bookended the, uh, the five Cs. Uh, communication, when it comes to that, what are your principles around effective communication for decision-making? 
Well, so often when we think of communicating, we think of talking. And if there is someone else who's going to be affected by the decision, we think about a lot about what are we going to say to that person? How are we going to you know, convince them about our point of view if they might have a different one? But really a huge part of communication and good communication is listening. And it's about setting up the conditions for a good conversation. And so one thing that I have really taken away from all the research and the work we've done on the book is to think as much about when and where that you're going to have big conversations than the what of what you're going to say. And so that might mean um, not springing a big discussion about um, if you're going to move on your partner as you are brushing your teeth, getting ready for bed, or you are trying to get the kids out the door in the morning. It might mean actually making an appointment with that person, which can seem weird if they're the person we see all the time, but you have to make sure you're both mentally in the right place to have the big conversation. And so even just simply saying, hey, I have something on my mind I'd love to speak with you about. Can we think about a time, maybe this weekend, that we can have that conversation. And then leave your house, leave the place that has all the day-to-day -day stresses, the dishes that are in the sink, the laundry that's not folded. Go outside. I mean, my husband and I have had a lot of luck going on hikes and talking about big decisions. Our kids are running up ahead and we're uh, in an expansive state of mind because we see you know, beautiful scenery and we're actually letting ourselves um, think differently than when we're mired in the day to day. And those conditions and really listening to the other person when they share what they're thinking are two often overlooked elements of the communication step. I think that's that's a very good way to put it, that it's not just about what you say, it's the setting that you put it into. What about choices? So choices is, I love choices actually, because when we are faced with a big decision, we often focus on uh, binaries. So we think about, do I um, marry this person or I do I break up with them? Do I um, go for the promotion or do I quit this job? And the truth is that there are so many options in between, and that's where you can get really creative. And the choices and the check-in step actually go hand in hand, because when you're really in the thick of a decision, you might overlook some of the options available to you. And so checking in with friends and family and trusted resources allows you to generate more options that get you out of that tunnel vision that let you see, oh, right, I thought that, you know, I'll give you an example from my own life, to get more space, I need to move. I need a bigger house. I need to, you know, find a way to get a home office, for example, which is something that I very much did not have at the start of uh, COVID and, and then, you know, needed. But what I found by checking in with other people and seeing what solutions they had creatively come up with is that you can rent a space that is outside of your home, which is incidentally where I do my best work. And that would not come with all of the hassle and the expense of moving, but would actually get me the outcome of having additional space where I can do my work. And so that is a very key element of generating additional choices that you might not come up with just in the moment when you are thinking about a decision. Is the main difference about decisions regarding money and love that they're just grander, that they have uh, more impact on our life? Or is there something particularly special about them outside of that? I like that way of putting it, that they have more impact on our life. They often are um, very personal, right? They're, they're, uh, they're not ones that other people, you might want other people to tell you what to do, but they're not ones that other people can really choose for you and have them uh, have the the be in the um, alignment with your core values. Uh, and so so I, they're very idiosyncratic. It's it's not like saying uh, this particular dish is the best pizza at this pizzeria. You should get that because I had that last time. And you go, well, the difference, the, the degrees of freedom you have in pizza taste is probably not as wide as it is in ideal relationship or financial or marital setup. Yes. And they're, and they're, um, they have life-changing effects on us. And so if you have a piece of pizza that somebody else recommends, you know, you might have a, a, a good meal or, you know, a 
not so good meal if you didn't like that piece of pizza, but it's not really going to affect your life. And so the the fact that your life's trajectory can actually be altered by these decisions make them higher stakes. And when they are higher stakes, then they are more daunting and more um, can be more paralyzing. Why do money concerns influence our love decisions? I thought I thought that we should be marrying for love, falling in love. You know, uh, uh, why is there a financial component to the person that we're going to spend the rest of our life with? Well, because when you uh, connect your life with someone, then their financial decisions. Uh, have an impact on you in a very real sense of that debt collectors can come after you, that their debt becomes your debt, uh, that their windfalls in places that are community property states become your windfalls. And so um, not only are there actual impacts to the dollars, but then your career is powerfully influenced by uh, the person who you connect your life with. And, and particularly if you want children, um, very particularly if you are uh, in a heterosexual relationship and you are the, the mom, um, you are by default, by society, um, often expected to do more of the caregiving. And if you do not have a partner who um, sees eye to eye on sharing the work uh, equally, um, doesn't need to be split down the middle, but but really having a, a true stake in um, caring for the loved ones that you've uh, committed to caring for, that, uh, that that can have real implications on, on women's careers. We've saw that during COVID when so many women stepped out of the workforce, millions uh, of women to care for children who were no longer able to be in school. And so there are really real implications financially for, um, for the person who you decide to spend your life with. What sort of assessment or decision criteria should you go through when looking at settling down with someone and thinking right well i guess i'd better get the self-assessment tax return out what do you what do you do <laughs> i mean it's not the most romantic thing for a first date but certainly if you are deciding to move in together i mean even to to spend time with someone we go through in our book um, big conversations that you should have before you might feel ready and this is something that when I took my co-author's class, I was dating someone who I had been seeing for less than a year, and we were making decisions about, do we look for a job in the same city after we graduate? Do we live together if we end up in that same city? And you know, it, it was awkward to have those conversations. We had, you know, certainly would prefer to push them off, but talking about um, what does it mean to us to uh, live together? Uh, does that do we are we doing that with the expectation of getting engaged or not? How would we contribute to the rent? I mean, all of those things actually forced us to have these big conversations that, number one, were um, enabled us to see that we were compatible in ways that we might not have known otherwise, and actually made us feel more close to each other because we had had those vulnerable conversations and shared what we were hoping for our lives and careers and and actually brought us closer and so we outlined some of those conversations in the book um and and i would say you know i was had certainly dated people before and made decisions about um, being, you know, moving in with people before and not had those conversations. And I saw the difference in really how having these types of big discussions and using this shared, um, these, those shared conversations to determine, you know, okay, is this person uh, someone who I think I want to spend my life with just makes such a huge difference in your confidence in that that relationship is uh, the right one and that it's going in the right direction, that you want the same things in the long term. What are those sorts of conversations or what are some of the biggest or most important ones that people should have at an uncomfortably early stage? Well, certainly about your career aspirations. Um, and so are you somebody who, you know, what is your level of ambition? What type of um, career do you want? What do you, do you want one that you're moving around all the time? Are you expecting someone to be picking up and moving with you when that happens? Um, so that's a huge topic, a uh, topic of children. 
Do you want them? Um, how many? When? Um, that's a, another huge topic. Um, the topic about money that we just talked about. So, you know, do you have debt? Um, what do you spend uh, reckless amounts of money on? Um, things that are, you know, seem theoretical at first, but then if you just do decide to spend your life with somebody, actually have real implications on, you know, if you're marrying someone, if you want to spend your life with someone who always wants the latest gadget and they're going to get the new iPhone when it comes out and they're going to get, you know, upgrade their car every few years. I mean, that might mean you can't take the vacations that might be important to you, right? So those mm, tight start to tease out the trade-offs and the compromises that you might have to make. Um, talking about uh, family and what that means to you. Do you want to live near them? The Where you want to live is a big topic of conversation and certainly one that with uh, more and more remote work is uh, actually can create more choice, which is not always such a good thing. So making sure you're on the same page with a future partner about where you want to live. Is it important to you to be near family? Um, do you uh, want to be in a city? Do you want to be in um, close to nature? All of those things are important to talk about. I know that it might sound quite uh, odd to be discussing the wisdom in asking some of the most basic questions that are going to impact your compatibility with a partner, but it is rare to front load those sorts of conversations early in a relationship because people don't want to come across as being too keen. They don't want to scare the other person away. It's this big, you know, these decisions inherently are difficult and challenging and front loading them, deciding, okay, let's discuss many of them or even all of them now just feels, it feels effortful and, and challenging and scary. But the alternative is to continue down this path with somebody up until the point at which you are further invested and potentially so invested that it, you, it's very difficult to turn around or, or make a different decision. And now you're stuck having to make trade-offs, which is going to cause conflict. Um, so yeah, I mean, make sure that the person that you're with has values and a life plan that aligns with yours. Sounds kind of obvious, but is also, I, I think it's pretty rare. It is rare. And every year that my co-author would teach her class on work and family that our book is based on, she would have students who would email her or write to her after the class and say, I just want to let you know, thanks to your class, I've broken up with my long-term partner and it was really painful, but I realized we did not want the same things. And the more that we, you know, continue to be together, the more I would be compromising what I want. And she would write back and say, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for, you know, the pain that this has caused you and congratulations, because that is a very brave and courageous decision to go after what you want uh, and find someone who will support you in what you want. Have you considered the challenges in the modern dating world with unlimited choice, online dating and Instagram and so on and so forth? That's a choice as well. That's a decision too. How can people cut through these sorts of unlimited choice scenarios? Well, what I love is that there is research on this. Uh, one of my other professors at Stanford, who I studied with, Baba Shiv, has done research on the effects of two types of choice. One is uh, sequential choice, which is the type of choice you have on the dating apps. You can always swipe and find someone else. And uh, there is this eternal quest for the best that helps you, makes you think that there's the perfect person is just, you know, a, a one swipe away and I'll just, you know, continue to date and find that person versus what he calls simultaneous choice, which is when you bound the choice. And he talks about he's from India. And so when he decided that he wanted to find a partner and get married, he told his parents, they presented three different potential suitors. Uh, he met them in the similar time frame, couple, same few months, went on several dates with them, and found the one that he felt he clicked with the most. Fortunately, she also felt the same way. They got married and have been married for decades. And he has um, replicated the effects of simultaneous choice versus sequential choice in other places and found that people who um, identify their best choice from a, 
a number of choices that they experience simultaneously uh, have are more satisfied with the outcomes. And so there are ways, even if you're not in an arranged marriage situation, um, to do the same thing. So comparing um, the person who is the most likely candidate, who you you know enjoy spending time with the most, to maybe the the person who you feel was the best candidate, like the the suitor you enjoyed the most in your uh, most recent dating history, uh, that can be a way to kind of fake, if you will, the simultaneous choice and and not just keep feeling like, okay, well, the next person is right around the corner because um, you're right, that that paradox of choice we've seen does not lead to happiness and it can lead to a lot of frustration, actually. What if you're already in a relationship and you're considering getting married? What are the things to consider before you decide to take that step? Is there anything unique that we haven't covered already? Uh, well, I think a, a big part of getting married is formally, legally tying yourself to someone and, and your finances. And so one of the things we talk about is prenups, because prenuptial agreements are on the rise. We have a lot of people who grew up, uh, for example, with divorced parents um, that are seeing, you know, the consequences of that on their own family's finances. People are getting married later, and so they're more likely to have a lot of assets and or a lot of debt. And so it's very important to, um, we don't think it's important to have a prenup necessarily, but to go through the same conversations and have the same discussions you would have if you were setting one up, which include disclosing all of your uh, debt and being financially transparent with one another, talking about, um, the the assets that you have, uh, talking about what's important to you financially. And um, you can do that certainly formally with the support of attorneys, or you could do that uh, informally with one another, maybe even with a facilitator like a therapist or a financial coach. Uh, and we, we did a survey as part of our book and as part of the research, we heard from a number of people who said, we actually went through the steps of uh, having those conversations didn't go so far as to drop the legal document, but feel like we got the the best of both worlds because we now are going into this marriage with our eyes wide open. And I like to say that a wedding is actually a microcosm of all of the issues that you face uh, as a couple. And so you you have to agree on the role of religion and spirituality in the day. You have to agree on family and um, how much influence uh, financially and otherwise you want them to have on your day to think about um, the people who are important to you and make decisions about um, whether the day is really about you or about them. And so if you can survive <laughs> that planning process um, and come out, you know, on the other side with an experience that is meaningful, uh, you are you are likely uh, to be well set up. But the challenge is that most many couples really focus on that day at the expense of the rest of their lives. And we know a day is over very quickly. And so the more that you can have those conversations leading up to marriage about what you want in the long run, what's most important to you, how the other person can support you in those goals, the better off that you're able to be. Are you saying discuss the prenup as you're going down the aisle? Is that the best approach for it? Uh, no. Ideally, you would have those discussions far before you walked down the aisle. <laughs> okay, if you say so. I mean, this is a very unromantic, unsexy part of romance, right? Like I have a number of friends that are married and all of them have had discussions like this. <clears throat> One of them uh, had a, a contentious discussion with his partner about prenup and lack thereof that they were going to go in with. And it's difficult. It's, it's, it's a concern with... Um, uh, finding a partner who happens to match you in terms of your financial resources and financial future is is rare. And then people have got concerns about divorces happening. But then it, it also, if there is a disparity in terms of either resources now or wealth potential in the future, it kind of feels a little bit like someone's already got one foot out of the door. It could be interpreted in that sort of way. So it's just a messy, a very, very messy, messy decision. Uh, and one that I haven't I haven't considered about the nuts and bolts of of what that looks like, but yeah, it doesn't surprise me that it probably takes a number of hours, many, many hours to discuss, okay, so how are we actually going to do this? Well, 
it's messy, but I would argue that going into a relationship and a marriage without those conversations is really uh, has the potential to be a lot messier <laughs> because um, you really it is much better to uh, get all of that out in the open and be transparent um, before you've made promises to one another uh, than it is on the other side of it. And you know, I am now at the age where I have friends uh, who are uh, getting divorced uh, sometimes after several decades of marriage. And um, it is, it is, that is a lot messier. Let's just put it that way. I get you. Uh, what about before having kids? What costs should people think about before they have children? Well, the cost that so many people are shocked to see, it's its less of a shock, I think, these days, because it actually has been in the news more um, with with COVID and the, the lack of our infrastructure being uh, revealed is childcare. And often people uh, don't realize how much it costs to raise a child, which uh, the estimates are about half a million dollars um, up through uh age 18 and certainly more than that um, when you tack on college. Um, but the early years are where a, a lot of the, um, it can feel as if your entire paycheck is going to pay to someone to um, help care for your child when you're at work. And uh, the math that I think is so tricky is that often people uh, deduct those childcare costs from, again, in a heterosexual couple, the woman's paycheck. And they say, Okay, if you're, you know, not making, if you're making either the same as it costs to uh, have a nanny or uh, less than that, then it's just not worth it. And the truth is that that's really flawed math. One of the things that my co-author taught in her class is, no, no, no. You add the paychecks together, you deduct the childcare from the joint paycheck because it is actually a long-term investment in the careers of both of you so that you nobody uh, has to pause their career if they don't want to, uh, to care for a child because it is a lot harder to go back into the workforce if you, if you take a pause. Um, and you know that you will not need a nanny forever. Uh, what, what you don't realize though is that schools close for the summer, they get out at 3 p.m. And so you will likely need some form of childcare, summer camps, after school programs, for a very long time, certainly in until your children can uh, take care of themselves. And so just going in with your eyes wide open to all of the costs, how you're going to approach it, um, how you both want your child to be cared for. Some people feel very strongly that they only want family members to care for their children, whereas other people uh, would rather have a very large village. And if they don't happen to live near their family, they're willing to pay for it. Um, and so getting on the same page about your approach, your feelings about childcare, your feelings about how you want your careers to go, um, actually how you'll divide the work. And this is, it sounds so mundane and boring um, compared to the idea of bringing in a new life to the world. But frankly, like, who's going to wash the bottles and who's going to prepare the food and pack the lunches is where it breaks down for a lot of couples. And so making sure that you have a plan and you've discussed how it's all going to shake out in terms of responsibility can be uh, very important. And that's, we have an exercise in the book where you go through and look at all of the different tasks required to take care of a household and take care of a child and talk about, are you, you know, who in a, in a, again, in a couple, um, you have three choices. You have, well, I guess you have four choices. You have, you know, person A can do it. You have person B could do it. You have, you could outsource it, or I guess you could just not do it and just, you know, have a messy house. And <laughs> I mean, you can't not care for a child, but there are some tasks you can cross off. Um, and so going through and, you know, my husband and I used to be guest speakers in my co-author's class for over, for about a decade. And we would joke, uh, that we were making the drive. It's about 45 minutes from San Francisco to Palo Alto. We would check in with each other about how our division of labor was going at home because we were about to get in front of a class and air our dirty laundry to the whole class. And, you know, better if something's not, you know, working for you, tell me now so that we don't <laughs> complain about it in front of the class. And that was actually, we joked about it, but it was helpful because there were some things where we realized, oh, like I'm really sick of doing this. And I really wish you could, you know, would you be willing to take this on? And, you know, one of those things with thank you notes, like, I, I wish I didn't care about thank you notes, but I do. And so I supervised my children writing thank you notes for a really long time. 
But at some point, I would rather like poke my eye out with the pen that they were using than, you know, help them write the thank you notes. And so thankfully, my husband agreed, okay, I will take over the thank you note job. And um, he said, How many doing thank that. you notes are they producing? I mean, you would be surprised if you have a class of 25 kids and, you know, you're getting a lot of birthday presents, <laughs> it's more thank you notes than you want. Okay. I, I, I'm not going to argue with you. What is your advice for people who might be in relationships that are less uh, communicatively transparent than yours is? It seems like you and your partner have a, um, a lot of openness with regards to this, perhaps unsurprising given how you met. Um Broaching these sorts of subjects, especially consistently, can cause friction. You're always na nagging me or bugging me about this thing. There's always a new problem here. There's always a new... What are some of your pieces of advice for people that are in relationships to bring up issues and challenges in a way which is uh, engenders the sort of response that they're looking for, which is one that's collaborative? Well, a lot of that goes back to the setting and so are you just springing this on on your partner when they're watching their favorite tv show are you you know uh, having it we actually recommend and, and this is a practice that we've been doing uh, i've been doing for a while having a weekly check-in um we call it uh tcob taking care of business where we just have it on the calendar and i mean it's not the most romantic thing, but you just, you know, have half an hour and we go through the calendar for that week. We say, you know, who's doing pickup and drop off. Um, it's our opportunity to kind of bring up other things. Like right now we're planning a trip and we were looking at Airbnb listings uh, on, on, in that time. And so if there's something on the calendar, you don't have to constantly feel like you have to nag and bring up. It's just like, it's on the calendar. We do it on, you know, Friday afternoons and that's the time. So the, the very small step I would suggest for a couple who is like, how do I break out of this rut of one person constantly bugging the other person? Just say, hey, can we set a time every week to just check in on, you know, the mundane tasks that we have to take care of by nature of being in a household together, being in a relationship together. And you can set it whatever time you want. You can make it really fun. I know a couple that goes out for drinks on Friday and talks about it. Personally, when I go out for drinks, I do not want to talk about who's doing pickup and drop off. So our preference is to you know, have a, a different approach, but uh, you can tailor it to you and um, you can just try it. You could say, hey, I was listening to this podcast and this author was on talking about having a weekly meeting where you talk about all the boring stuff involved in running a, a household together. Um, and once that meeting's on the calendar, it's more likely to happen. Nobody has to bring it up um, and have an agenda and just go through it. And um, you could even have a walking meeting. I mean, again, it's up to the person's, you know, everyone's preference, but uh, certainly to have a, um, a neutral setting and a neutral way so that it's not just the same person um, bringing it up over and over again can go a long way. I like the idea of creating a bucket in which all of the things that need to be discussed can be discussed. I think that you're going through your day, you're in the car with your partner, you've, you've just been talking about that recent movie that you watched that you both loved or The Last of Us or whatever, the song that just came on on the radio or reflection about when you went to go and see your parents last year and it was a catastrophe or whatever. And then somebody brings up admin, right? One of these taking care of business decisions. And it, it seems to cross the boundary between the personal and the organizational in a little bit of a way. And I wonder whether bundling it all together it's like it's look I, I you not taking care of the thank you notes isn't a comment on your worth as an individual or my value in you as a partner but it is something that we need to discuss so maybe i don't bring it up just after we've been talking about stuff that's a little bit more touchy-feely and makes me feel nice about the song on the radio or the last of us or whatever so i, I think that's a very very good solution actually one one thing you mentioned um regrets earlier on and challenges what is the most common life decision regret that you've witnessed in your research? Not doing things, not taking risks, not uh, trying something that you have always wanted to. Um, so people don't regret um, 
working too hard they do, or they don't regret, um, you know, I didn't spend enough time at the office. I mean, people regret not spending time with people they love and not taking risks, not going for um, the big move or not um, trying something, even if they didn't know if this was going to succeed. Uh, and that's something that we've we've all experienced over the last three years where our choices got really narrowed, right? There were places we couldn't visit. There were people we couldn't see. There were a lot of things that we couldn't do. And I think uh, what we're seeing in this current time where many of those restrictions have been removed is people making those choices to visit the place that they always wanted to see or to move closer to the person who they couldn't see when they lived half a world away and no planes were taking off, right? So um, that is certainly... Uh, a big part of what the research says is the the, re the regret of not doing the thing. Why do you think that is? What do you think that says about us psychologically, adaptively as humans? I think as humans, we are daunted by the unknown, uh, but we love possibility. We love um, the idea that we could uh, publish a book that we could um, uh, spend time with the person who we really care about, but only if we take that leap, right? And so, um, yes, you might not know how things are going to go, uh, but that's not a reason not to do something. And so part of what our framework offers is uh, the ability to Again, make sure you uh, have done your homework, have have stepped through all the steps to get out of the emotional way of making a decision that, again, might lead to regret. I'm not doing this because I'm scared. I'm not doing this because um, I, I don't know how it's going to work out. Uh, but pushing past that and tapping into the things that could give you more confidence, not about how it's going to work out, but that you approached it in a way that is valid, that is um, proven to uh, be effective and likely to leave you feeling more confident and empowered. Yeah, it's it's so interesting to consider that the things we regret are not the things that we did, but the things that we didn't do. And I don't know, I, it, it makes me think that we just over egg our risk aversion, conservative nature a little bit. But everyone's concern is, okay, so maybe I can kind of just like a sniper does, I'll just adjust my sights. I'll just tune down my risk aversion by 10 or 20%. And that'll get me about there. But then you go, oh, yeah, but what, what, what if it's on a, a category of decision to which I shouldn't have done that? And then, so um, yeah, I think if there is ever something reassuring that everybody could learn about the nature of decision-making, in life's big decisions and about the concern that they have about regrets for the fu in the future of things that they haven't done in right now, it is precisely that. It's the fact that people end up regretting the stuff that they didn't do. And there's also some evidence that I'd seen that suggests people that make big life decisions generally, on average, end up to be happier. That it just, just by making a big change that they end up being in a happier place. I wonder whether that satisfies just a bit of novelty seeking perhaps that people have you know <clears throat> objectively it could be a, a slightly worse town but subjectively the fact that it's somewhere new and there's all of these different people and stuff for you uh, and also your framing around the present moment largely determines your experience of it in any case so if it is an adventure you can pick yourself up by your bootstraps there uh one other side of this i suppose the dark side of marriage is if it needs to finish or the dark side of a relationship is if it needs to split up what's the process for working out whether or not you should get divorced or break up with a partner i recently heard the term complete a relationship which i thought was a, a nice <laughs> oh term my God. No, no that's no that's that that makes it sound like that's what everybody is working towards <laughs> it's true it's maybe not the aspiration but it is a a, a kinder way of speaking about it um well my co-author has been divorced and she talks a lot about uh the importance of an amicable divorce. And certainly if there are children involved, um, you can um, get to the point where you, you know, maybe are not seeing eye to eye with the person who you have 
decided to spend your life with anymore. And by the way, we are big believers in therapy. So working with a trained professional, sometimes when you're just two people and it's, you know, uh, one person against the other person, um, it's hard to break out of that dynamic. And so bringing in someone else who can say, you know, yes, you can work through these issues or no, I see these as really intractable problems that are going to be very challenging. That can be very helpful. Um, that was something that my co-author did in, in her marriage, our first marriage. And, um, you know, the, the therapist thought, no, this, this isn't actually a marriage that I think, uh, is going to be able to be resuscitated. And so they did part ways, but they also did that very deliberately wanting to, um, not have their children, because they had two at the time, uh, be put in a position of having to choose, you know, which parent they're going to take sides of. And so they, um, they had an amicable divorce. And actually, when my co author got remarried, her new husband said, you know, what do you think about inviting um, her ex husband who, who he also knew uh, to Thanksgiving? And she said, are you kidding? No. <laughs> Why would I want to do that? He said, well, you know, otherwise your kids are going to have to have two Thanksgivings or not see one of their parents on Thanksgivings. And she said, ask me again in five years. And so he was a patient person. He asked again. And in five years, she said, okay, let's give it a try. They all had Thanksgiving together. And it actually went so well that at the end of the meal, uh, her ex-husband and who was now remarried, uh, they toasted uh, the uh, his ex-wife. And he said, thank you so much for inviting us to do this. This was so meaningful. And they continued doing it um, for decades. And so um, it is possible to get to a point, even if you no longer want to spend your life with someone, to uh, have shared experiences that that are uh, bigger and bigger than the two of you that allow um, their children, in that particular instance, to uh, to have both of their parents together on a meaningful day. What do you think would predict a less amicable divorce? If you were to design a um, way for the partners to communicate with each other, the sort of things they would say, the way that the divorce would be enacted, what would you do if you wanted to cause the worst divorce possible? Try to win. What do you mean? <laughs> so uh, try to exact the most money from the person, try to get everything on your terms, try to um, not agree to anything that they want, try to not compromise. Um, so if you are trying to not have an amicable divorce, really seeing it as a one-time negotiation, right? Where you are more likely to just try to get your way at all costs. Um, if you're, if you've clarified what's important to you, and if that Clarity has told you what's important to me is having uh, an amicable relationship with this person. So I'm not uh, constantly um, pitting myself against them or making my children, if we have them, uh, choose. Then uh, you might agree to some things that are not ideal. So, um, an example, a story that I, I heard is um, a woman and her husband got divorced, they had a teenage son. And she knew that if she uh, stayed in the house with her son, it would be unlikely that he would see his father that often. Um, his father was uh, just not some not a big planner. Um, that was part of the challenge. Uh, and she said, you know, it's more important to me that he has a strong relation, that my son has a strong relationship with his father than it is for me to stay and live in the house with them. So she was the one that moved out. She, you know, continued to visit. She spent time with him. Um, but they, it ended up that he, her son had a much closer relationship with his father as a result of their living arrangements than he would have if she hadn't made that concession. And she feels, you know, she gave up five years of, of being able to live with her son, but it was for the greater good of his relationship with his dad. That's a very selfless act to do that. And I imagine that as somebody approaches the end of a divorce, which is, you know, by by its nature, not exactly a paradise to get through. There will be resentments and, and, and unanswered questions and that thing that you did that I couldn't stand you doing anymore. Uh, so for somebody to be such a, uh, the bigger person or uh, a more noble person at least and do that 
I think is uh, a pretty good sign. Maybe he's let a, a good one go with regards to that. When it comes to choosing where to live, whether this is you moving with a, a partner or not, I, I recently made the move from the UK to Austin, Texas. And that was something that had been on my mind for a long time. Do I want to, to be here in the northeast of the UK? It's this place that I was born in and I've always wanted to travel somewhere else. Uh, but it was a very difficult decision to make. I had to let go of a lot of things. I would have to sell this business that I'd spent a decade and a half building with my best friend who I was the groomsman at his wedding and sat next to in my first ever seminar at university. And I'm, I'm going to lose my sense of identity. I was this big name on campus, club promoter guy in Newcastle, and it was a relatively small city. And I'm going to go to this brand new country where I don't know anybody, basically, and see if I can do this talking to people on the internet thing and make a career out of that. Um, what what should I have done that would have made the decision about whether or not I should move uh, more simple and easy for me? Uh, well, congratulations, because you will not have the regret of never making that move and seeing how it would be if you uh, had moved to Austin. One of the things I hope you did before you moved was visit uh, and get yes, a chance I did, to... I did, I did, yes, I did that, I did that. <laughs> yeah, um, and sometimes even, you know, renting a place for a month, right? And, and Did exactly that, Airbnb did it. Yeah. And so you get a sense of, okay, if I'm not just swooping in on a weekend and having all this fun, but actually approximating the life I would have if I lived here, like I'm going to have to do laundry. I'm going to have to go to the grocery store. I'm going to have to, you know, experience the like not fun parts of living someplace. Oh, so you're offsetting the holiday effect. Yes, exactly. Um, so try to, I mean, this is in design thinking, um, it's called prototyping, right? So you're trying to prototype what your life would be if you lived in Austin. So you are um, spending more time there than just a weekend. Um, you can talk to people who made similar moves um, to either that specific city. I mean, it's obviously most helpful, but I mean, there's a lot of people who've been moving to Austin recently. Um, and so getting a chance to talk to them about what they like, what they don't like, what they wish they had known before they joined um, that community can be very helpful. Um, and, you know, so these are parts of our framework, right? So um, the this is the check-in part, uh, talking to people, trying to approximate it, um, and then, you know, playing out the consequences. So, uh, you know that the first part of living somewhere, there will be a lot of novelty, you'll be disoriented, but it'll be fun and new. Um, but, you know, what are the places that, um, what are the things that in the medium term might be hard, what might be easy, um, what might go wrong, might, what might go really right? Um, so playing out as many of those scenarios as possible so that um, you start to get a sense of, uh, of, of do the kind of positives, the potential things that could go right outweigh the things that might be hard or uncomfortable um, in the in those different time horizons. I did some of those. I did I I stumbled upon a number of those. So I feel uh vindicated that I I didn't make the decision like a total idiot. But yeah, I think the um that it's definitely a very, very smart idea if you are looking to move somewhere to try and just test what's life going to be like. Where can I go and get my hair cut? How about the traffic? What's the weather like in the middle of... I mean, I couldn't test what the weather was like in the middle of summer and there was 60 days where it didn't drop below 100 last year, but that's a... I'll take that. That's a price that I'm prepared to pay. Uh, one other thing that you spoke about that I've never really heard anybody talk about is elder care uh, as you get toward the end of life. What's, what, what are the insights around that? Well, it's one of the... So Myra's class, my co-author's class, had a um, a class on it. And there was a speaker who came in and talked about different types of elder care, what are different options. And I took notes, but I tuned it out, right? It just seemed like something I wouldn't have to think about for decades. And then as it turns out, as life would have it, uh, my mother had a very bad accident. She fell and hit her head and had brain swelling um, and trauma. And I had to think about these things much earlier than I had anticipated. And so um, I actually got out the notes from the course, and a lot of it is the research that we talk about in our chapter on elder care, um, thinking about um, how to have these conversations with our parents or other uh, elder relatives that we might be having them with. Um, the key, a key is to tread lightly. Um, it is These are very tricky conversations. Um, they are uncomfortable, um, 
for you and likely for that other person. And so doing it with respect, with grace, um, trying to understand what's important to uh, the other person as well as what's important to you. And um, certainly checking in with other people. One of the things that um, I did when when my parents, they actually ended up moving out across the country to where I lived in California um, when my mom um, needed more care. Uh, and then they lived in a condo and they had home health aides, uh, but then they needed, then my mom needed more care than those aides were able to provide. And so um, I asked my father if he had thought about uh, life plan communities, which are communities that have an element of independent living, an element of skilled, uh, of element of assisted living, and then an element of skilled nursing. And so at that point, my mom needed the skilled nursing. My dad would have been in the independent living. And he said, you know, I haven't looked at any of those. I don't think we could afford it. And I said, well, I think, you know, let's just tour a couple of them. We'll ask some questions. We'll do some math. And it turned out that um, they, they found one that accepted my mother's insurance. And um, and so having me as someone else who was um, part of the conversation, but not in the decision myself, um, was very helpful to my father at that time. And he, it turns out there have been a number of my friends, parents who have moved into the same community where he lives today, because he's had such a positive experience there. And so uh, I have ended up being a bit of a guide for a lot of friends who faced this uh crossroads later than I did. Um, and, and understanding people's experiences can be so helpful when you're facing those same, uh, same choices. What are the main kinds of elder care? Um, well, so if you have, um, say your loved one wants to remain in their home as long as possible, um, you can hire people to come into that home. They're called home health aides, or, um, there are, other other folks who can um, are trained in how to care for elders, uh, but sometimes I mean that's very expensive, um, and so and there's a shortage of care workers um, as there is across the board in so many of these industries, um, and so there are also these communities where you can um, go and and have rooms. Um, there are almost like dorms <laughs> for um, older adults and lots of activities and other um, other elements of a, a vibrant community, um, but they're also expensive. I mean, and and so having well, one of the things we talk about in the book is long-term care insurance, because um, very few states offer that. Washington state is one of the um, few states that have passed laws that um, actually you're paying into long-term care insurance by virtue of living in that state. But in other places, it is largely up to the individual. Um, there is... Um, health insurance available for older people through Medicare and Medicaid, but it is very, um, does not cover a lot of that long-term care. Um, I understand. Yeah, it's uh, very interesting. I have a friend whose uh, dad was very ill, but very rich. And uh, they had this really difficult situation with inheritance because in the UK, the way that it works, <clears throat> if you gift your children, I think it's 350,000 pounds is the upper bound limit. Anything over that, you get taxed at some ungodly percentage if you pass away within the space of seven years. And this father had spent his entire career building up a very large portfolio of businesses, and he was a super driven guy and still had a lot of self-pride and stuff like that. Uh, and it was because, I mean, the way that he got ill was kind of out of nowhere. So how are you supposed to predict that sort of stuff? But I was about to say there's no such thing as too early of a time to have this discussion, but if your parents are still pretty independent, you go, hey, mom and dad, how do you feel about me chatting about you becoming older and maybe needing help from professional help from people? Me thinking about me, would I, is that the sort of, the, oh, is that what my children think of me? My children think that I, I can't take care of myself or that, that I'm, going to, I'm going to kick the bucket soon. That also doesn't feel like an easy conversation to have. There's difficult conversations everywhere. There are, there, it is a very difficult conversation, but I would argue that it is easier when you don't need to make those decisions imminently. And so if you're saying, I mean, I always say, blame it on the book, right? Just say, I read this new book. It's <laughs> called Money and Love. There's a chapter on elder care and it yeah. talks about having these conversations earlier than you want to, which is by the way, never. We never want to think about our loved ones becoming 
you know, unable to take care of themselves. And the truth is that at some point, everyone's loved ones um, will either die or become unable to take care of themselves. And so uh, this is one of those places where just eyes wide open, um, having those conversations and just saying, hey, what do you want? Do you want us to, you know, to have something called an advanced directive, right, which tells um, doctors, uh, how much do you want to be resuscitated? You know, do you want to be um, help breathing? Do you want have help uh, having your heartbeat, right? And so those are uh, documents that that actually are medically necessary when you get to the point of being in the hospital. And um, again, we are all going to get to that point if we're lucky to live long enough. And so um, this is, you know, in, in the book, we talk about an advanced directive for driving, right? Having a um, document that says, when do you want to uh, turn uh, turn in your license, right? probably before you're forced to do that by um, the government. I mean, Myra talks about, my co-author talks about her mother actually getting her license taken away because she was driving so erratically and was stopped uh, by the police. And we don't, you know, <laughs> want that to happen. So what are the signs, yeah. right, that, that might get you to that point? And it's much easier to have that conversation in the abstract than uh, when it actually is uh, necessary. <laughs> Okay, I mean, let's bring this one home. Where should people go if they want to check out more of the stuff that you do in the book? So we have a website, moneylovebook.com, that has all sorts of places you could buy the book. We also have a quiz to uh, tell you what your money and love decision making style is. So we talked about you know the analyzers. There are also um, two other styles, and knowing your type, your tendency, can help you put in place uh, some guardrails uh to to overcome that tendency so that is a fun thing that we offer on the website as well all right abby thank you thank you so much what's happening people thank you very much for tuning in if you enjoyed that episode then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks and don't forget to subscribe peace <laughs>